Well, if you'd like to turn in your Bibles, we're going to read, um, as we did last week, from Matthew's Gospel and from the first chapter. We're going to read verses 18 through 25, because this is the place where Matthew, writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, points us back to that prophecy that was given by Isaiah and tells us that Isaiah was speaking about the Christ, was speaking about God coming to be with us. We'll read verses 18 to 25 of Matthew chapter 1. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. And Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her, planned to send her away secretly. But when he had considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child who has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Now, all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. And Joseph awoke from his sleep and did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took Mary as his wife, but kept her a virgin until she gave birth to a son. And he called his name Jesus. Now I think about Seven days ago from this pulpit, Pastor Bryant said that it was conventional um, on the Lord's Day before Christmas um, to have a sermon on the Incarnation. And he had no intention of disappointing us, and indeed, I don't think we were disappointed at all. Well, there are now approximately 361 days to Christmas. That's good news for the parents and not so good news for the children here, I suspect, this morning. Um, but clearly it's time to get ready. Um, so I thought this morning we could have a sermon on the Incarnation. Um, actually, uh, this is a wonderful theme anyway. That's not why I'm doing it, um, although it could be. Uh, but you may remember I have been doing an occasional series on the names that were given or are given to the Lord Jesus Christ in Scripture. And uh, it seemed to me, and um, this was suggested to me by a, a family member, that there could be no better time than this to look at this name, Emmanuel, and to try and uh, explore what this name uh, has to say to us about the Lord Jesus Christ. And as I started to look into it, I realized, actually, this is a wonderful New Year message to look at what this name means. Uh, last week, we considered the infinite stoop of the Lord Jesus Christ leaving heaven, coming to earth, emptying himself by taking flesh. Um, this week, we're going to look at what this name that he took upon himself at that time uh, in a certain way means, what it meant for God. Um, but we're going to spend 
most of our time looking at, at what it should mean for us. Um, so we're going to consider Emmanuel, God with us. And uh, you know that uh, every now and again I'm able to make uh, a sermon come by courtesy of a certain letter of the alphabet. Um, this one comes courtesy of the letter C. Because we're going to see that Emmanuel is a name of commitment. It's a name of condescension. It's a name of comfort. It's a name of confidence and courage. It's a name of contentment. It's a name of commission and of challenge. And it's a name of either conversion or of condemnation. So let's get right into that and we'll look first of all at a name of commitment. And uh, to help you to know where we are as we go through these, you'll see uh, the name or the, the heading on the screen. And uh, sometimes there'll be a scripture there as well which will focus our thinking under that heading. A name of commitment. By that I mean it's the name of God's commitment to save fallen man. We're going to see through this message that God with us uh, has several senses. Um, there is a sense in which Jesus always was and always will be Emmanuel. He always had been with his people. Remember when we read um, Exodus together uh, in the Reading the Bible Together program? We saw that. We saw how Jesus was with the people of God. We saw him in the burning bush. The angel of the Lord appeared to Moses. Uh, we saw him in the pillar of cloud and of fire, moving with his people and protecting them through uh, the wilderness. We saw him in the water that came from the rock. And we saw him pictured for us in the manna that came down from heaven. Jesus appeared to his people as the angel of the Lord at the time of Joshua. And in the time of the judges. In other words, Jesus was with his people, but in this sense, he appeared on occasion at special times in the history of the people. And he appeared as a man, even though he had not yet taken flesh. But God promised more. God promised something that, as we were thinking last week, was absolutely vital if this Jesus was indeed to save his people from their sins. He had to become truly and fully one of us. He had to dwell among us. He had to live a life of perfection in our place. He had to die a death on the cross as our substitute. And in our text back in Matthew, that is what is being announced. That is what the name Emmanuel means. God with us. In a second sense, he'd been there through the Old Testament from time to time, not as a man, but appearing as a man. Now, says God, he's going to come as a man, he's going to dwell among us. And even though it's 700 years before it happens, Isaiah gives us this name for the Lord Jesus Christ of Emmanuel. And it shows us that God is still fully committed to the plan. The plan that he announced in his curse of the serpent when Adam and Eve fell. The plan to send a seed of the woman who would crush the serpent's head. Emmanuel, 
He's coming. I am fully committed to the plan. And so, the Lord Jesus Christ comes in the fullness of time. So it's a name that shows God's commitment to be with his people in order to save them. Secondly, it's a name of condescension. Uh, We're not going to dwell on this because uh, we spent quite a bit of time on it last Lord's Day. But in the fullness of time, God's commitment to save his people led to the condescension of the Lord Jesus Christ to empty himself and to come into this world in order to dwell among us and be our Savior. John 1.14, the Word became flesh, we've already read this, and dwelt among us. And we saw his glory, the glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. God took flesh. This is the second sense in which Jesus is Emmanuel. He became really a man. He is still really a man. Made in the likeness of sinful man. Subject to human limitations and difficulties, but not to sin. And in the verse that is up there, Uh, where it says he dwelt among us. You probably know this. It quite literally says he tabernacled among us. In other words, he pitched his tent among our tents, talking about his body. He came and he inhabited the tent of a body and it was among our tents. Remember how? Uh, Back in in Old Testament days, you had the tabernacle with the Shekinah glory, the presence of God, right in the heart of the camp of Israel. And and the tribes were camped around about the tabernacle. Well, I think there's something of that imagery here. The Lord Jesus comes and dwells in the temple or the tabernacle of a body, the body of a man. And he dwells among the tabernacles or the tents. Uh, Peter calls his body a tent, I think, in, in one of his New Testament epistles. The tents of his people. God with us. Matchless condescension. So it's a name of commitment. These are mainly from God's perspective. A name of commitment. I am determined to save these people. And because of that commitment, it becomes a name of condescension as as Jesus empties himself by taking flesh and coming and pitching his tent um, among us. But now turn around and look at it from our perspective. And I want to spend most of the time now looking at Emmanuel in a third sense. It is a name of comfort to us, or it should be. The third sense in which Emmanuel, uh, or the Lord Jesus Christ is Emmanuel, is that it's not just, if we can put it in these terms, it's not just that he occasionally appeared as a man, although he hadn't taken flesh, and he was with his people like that in the Old Testament. It's not just, dare we say it, that he took flesh, and uh, became one of us and pitched his tent among us. It is that he is still with us now. John 14, verses 16 through 20. The disciples are crestfallen. Jesus is going away. What are we going to do? It's going to be hopeless. We can't do without him. How is it going to be for us? Jesus speaks to them and says, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may be with you forever. That is the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, 
because it does not see him or know him. But you know him because he abides with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. After a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. Because I live, you will live also. In that day, you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. Here's the third sense in which Jesus has this name, I believe, Emmanuel forever. When his tent ascended into glory, after his victory on the cross, and after his ascension, he poured out his Holy Spirit. The Spirit of Jesus came to live in the hearts of the people of God. Now, God is more fully and more intimately with us than ever before. He is not just an occasional visitor, wonderful as that was at special times in the Old Testament. It's not just, uh, and I, I hate to talk in these terms because we're, we're talking about glorious truths, but it's not that he took flesh and pitched his tent among us, He's moved into our tents. It's not his tent among our tents. It's Jesus come to live in us. God with us. And Jesus intended that knowledge to be a tremendous comfort to his disciples who knew in their heart of hearts, that shortly he was going away from them. But he says, but I'm not. I'm not going to leave you as orphans. I'm going to be in you by my Spirit. If I don't go to heaven, I can't pour him out. But he's going to come. I'm going to come. And I'm going to not just pitch my tent among you. I'm moving in. I'm going to take up residence in your heart. Now, uh, that was a comfort to the disciples then. I hope it's a comfort to you now. We're looking out ahead at a new year. We don't know what's going to happen. But we do know this. If we are his children this morning, he is Emmanuel. Emmanuel within us dwelling. Make us what thou wouldst have us be. He can be our comfort for this new year. Next, it's a name of confidence and of courage. Um, he's come to dwell in his people. Shouldn't that give us courage? As, as Paul says to the Romans, what shall we say to these things? If God is with us, Who's against us? Remember how, um, I think it was um, Elisha. Um, he's, he's got this troop from the king coming to destroy him, and his servants, Gehazi, is getting a little bit worried. And uh, Elisha says, don't worry. Those who are with us are far more than those who are against us. And he asks the Lord to open the eyes of his servant and the Lord opens his eyes and he sees the armies of heaven surrounding the prophet to defend him. And sure enough, no harm comes to him that day. Well, God is in you. God is with you. What harm can come to you? Of whom should you be afraid? Fear him. Ye saints, and you will then have nothing else to fear. Shouldn't we be confident of all the people on the face of this earth? Shouldn't we be confident? We who have the indwelling Christ, we who have God 
with us? Shouldn't that give us courage? For the new year and all the things we want to do for him, shouldn't that give us courage? So it, it's something that applies to us now, but it's confidence for the future as well. That's uh, why Paul writes to the Colossians about this mystery, the word that he's been preaching, the mystery hidden from long ages past and generations, but has now been manifested to his saints, to whom God willed to make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles. Gentiles. What is the riches of the glory of the mystery of the word of God that Paul preached? It's this, Christ in you, the hope of glory. The spirit of Christ in you is a down payment. He is a guarantee. He comes and he takes up residence in your heart and he witnesses with your spirit that you are a child of God. He guarantees that you can never be lost. It's not going to happen, is it? It can't happen. Can he have gone to such lengths to make you his child and then say, oops, that's not going to happen. No one for whom Christ died is going to be lost. And he gives us his spirit so that we may be certain that that is true. We'll never be lost. And his spirit works in us a longing. Uh, we, we, we start to understand that this isn't our home anymore. We might have a passport that says citizen of the United States or citizen of the United Kingdom. But our citizenship isn't here anymore. It's in heaven. And we have a guarantee, the Holy Spirit living within us. That's the hope of glory. Confidence for the future. And so as, as we, we look ahead into the new year, again, we should look with confidence, not in ourselves, but in our God and because of, of what we can do because he is in us, because he is Emmanuel to us still today. Emmanuel wasn't what happened 2,000 years ago. That's a very big part of it. We couldn't have Emmanuel God with us today unless we had Emmanuel God coming in flesh back then. But he is with us now. He's still Emmanuel to us now, it's a name of contentment because uh, his being with us should make us content. That's what the writer says to the Hebrews. Chapter 13, verse 5, make sure that your character is free from the love of money, being content with what you have. Well, what do I have? I don't have much in the bank account. I've got a job, maybe. Some of us don't. Um, I, I've been fed. I suppose I should be grateful for that. Um, I've, I've got a car. I've got broadband internet. No, 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 no. That's not what the writer to the Hebrews wants you to start the list with at all. Be content with what you have. What do I have? Emmanuel. Be content with what you have, for he himself has said, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Remember that hymn we sang from John Newton? And we got to the last verse, the soul that on Jesus has leaned for repose. I will not, I will not desert to its foes. That soul... Though all hell should endeavor to shake, I'll never, no, never, no, never forsake. Maybe you thought John Newton ran out of ideas for how to finish that last line of his hymn. And so he thought he'd put in a few extra negations just to be on the safe side and to make it scan. No. He's quoting this verse. If you go and look at the Greek 
of this verse. Those last few words, I will never desert you, nor will I ever forsake you. There is a five or six fold negation there. I will know not ever desert you. I will know never forsake you. It's powerful. It's strong. And because we have Emmanuel dwelling in us, the writer to the Hebrews says, what more do you want? You should be content with that. Here's the antidote to our avarice and greed, to our worldly celebration of Christmas. Looking at at what's going on in the celebration of Christmas, seeing um, uh, on the Facebook feed, um, people are caught up in the trimmings. People are getting excited because they've hung the stockings on the mantle and, and they've got a bright, sparkly tree and they're going to have a great meal. Be content with what you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you, nor will I ever forsake you. We have Emmanuel dwelling in our hearts. He gave himself for you. He has given himself to you. He's never going to forsake you. What more could you want? If having Christ in your heart does not make you content, what's it going to take? Even the thought is, is, is abhorrent. The Lord of glory coming to live in your heart and you're running off after tinsel and trees and traditions and not after him, not finding contentment in him. Well, for the new year, let's pledge ourselves to find our contentment in him, shall we? Because Emmanuel is a name of contentment. It's also a name of commission and challenge. Um, Matthew 28, you know these words, Jesus came up and spoke to them after his resurrection. And he says, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. Period. Go and do it. No. There isn't a period there, and thank God that the Lord Jesus Christ didn't finish the Great Commission with those words. He finishes them with these words, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. It's a name of commission to us. He's saying, as you obey me and go out with this message and make disciples of the nations, I will be with you. I think it was uh, people who said to George Whitfield, well, we're waiting until God sends his spirit, and then we're going to go out. And Whitfield said something like, I find he comes as I go. I'm not waiting. It's as we go that he will be with us. He won't be with us if we're not going to go. He saved us for a purpose. He saved us for a reason. He's leaving us here on earth for a reason, and that is to testify about him in our words and in our lives. We are to be different. We are to be filled with his Holy Spirit. And then he says, and he promises it here, I think this is a promise. You go and do this, and we should. But when you go and do this, know this. I'm with you, always, 
to the end of the age. And so in the coming year, let's take up this challenge from him. Let's put him to the test in this and see whether he won't be with us if we go out in his name and proclaim this gospel. Of course he will. You want to know him more fully with you? Get involved in obeying this commandment more fully and we will know him. I am certain of it. He'll be with us to give life and power to the message, with us to raise those who are dead in sins, with us to make them uh, his children, to become Emmanuel to them as he is to us. So let's take that on board for the new year. And then uh, the last two, it's a name either of conversion or of condemnation. Because if, if Jesus is your Emmanuel in this third sense, if he is one who has moved in to your heart and has taken up residence uh, in you by his Spirit, then you must be saved. Because he doesn't do that uh, for anybody else. He only does it for those uh, whom he has saved. First John uh, chapter 4, verses 15 and 16. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him, and he in God. We have come to know and have believed the love which God has for us. God is love. And the one who abides in love abides in God. And God abides in him. Emmanuel, God with us. So for you, Christian, Emmanuel is a name of special significance. God is with you. God is in you. He is your life. It's a name of conversion to you. He is Emmanuel. God with me. God in me. But if you haven't come to know the Lord Jesus Christ, then his name is a name of condemnation. John 3.36, He who believes in the Son has eternal life. But he who does not obey the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. He has been Emmanuel down through the ages. We've been thinking about that. It's in the Bible. You can go and look that up. He came and became Emmanuel by taking flesh some 2,000 years ago in order to offer himself as the only Savior from sin. And he lived on earth bodily uh, for a while. And then he went to the cross and then ascended, rose from the dead, ascended into heaven. And now he is Emmanuel living in his people. As we've seen, for his people, he is their comfort. He is or should be certainly their confidence and their courage. He should be their contentment, their all in all, and he has become the one who commissions and challenges them. They have a purpose as long as they serve here in his army. In short, for the Christian, he is their life. There is no life outside of Christ. It's not compartmentalized. So that today is Sunday, so that's my bit for God. The other six days is my bit for me. Uh, it doesn't work like that. Every day is a day for him, for the believer. He is our life. He's all that we want. He's all that we need. He is everything to us. But if you're not a Christian this morning, you know that he's willing 
to be all of these things to you too. You can't have sat here for any length of time under the ministry and, and not know that. Not know that Jesus every week has been here by his spirit reaching out his hand to you and saying, I want to be Emmanuel to you. I want to be with you. I want to save you. I want to be your comfort and your confidence. I want to challenge you to live for me in a world that's not a, an easy place to live as a Christian. I want to make you content by coming and, and dwelling in you. But you will have none of it. Every week, he says, will you come? Will you have me as your Emmanuel? I'll give you a future and a hope. But you don't want a future. You don't want the hope of glory. You don't want the King of Kings living in your heart. Because if you did want it, surely you would have done something about it by now. You're playing games with your soul to sit under the ministry here every week and every week to be invited to come to Christ, to have Christ himself, because it's Christ who speaks when, when the gospel is preached. Christ himself the King of Kings, reach out his hand and say, come to me. And you effectively say, well, not today. I've got better things to do. You're playing games. And, and quite literally, you're playing with fire because he won't hold out his hand indefinitely. The offer is there. And it's a day of grace. But for those who continue to turn their back on him and say, not for me. He doesn't continue to make that offer indefinitely. There comes a time when he'll just back away from you and he will let the sin that is in you harden your heart. So that you can't come. So that you won't come. And if it gets to that point, then you have sealed your fate for eternity. Because as strange as it may sound, his patience does have limits for those who continue to reject him, turn their backs on him, spit upon him, basically. Well, he's here again now. And he's reaching out to you again now and he's saying, I want to be Emmanuel to you. I want to be with you. Will you have me? Leave your sins and look at what I have done to make salvation possible. Look at what I went through because of my love for fallen man. I can deal with your heart. I can deal with your sin. I can give you life. I can give you a future and a hope. Will you have me? You know, you need him. What a wonderful name Emmanuel is for Jesus. God with us. God with us through the Old Testament the Old Testament people of God, God with us taking flesh and pitching his tent among our tents, God with us moving in to reside in his hearts and make his throne there uh, in the hearts of those who are his children. Now, can you imagine what 2014 looks like for this fellowship if we start to live in the light of Jesus, our Emmanuel, in this third sense, of him dwelling in us like this by his Spirit, if we take on board that comfort and uh, that 
contentment and that challenge. Can you imagine what that does? Well, let's turn to our God and let's pray that he may come upon us by his spirit and that we may begin to live more in the light of Jesus, our Emmanuel. Let's spend a few moments in quietness and seek the Lord that we may do these things for his glory. Amen.